what I want to do is build on something that uh, uh, Norm said last night, but he did 201. I want to do 101 this morning because I've been around long enough to know that sometimes some of the assumptions that are made, even in good Bible teaching churches, are not safe assumptions. One of the things that, uh, that uh, Norm, uh, one of the, the presumptions he made is that you understand that the Father is identified as God, right? Like in 2 Peter 1.17, that Jesus is identified with God as God. I'll give you several of those in this workshop. That the Holy Spirit, like in Acts 5, 1 through 5, is identified as God. So when he says that they're identified as God, and when they are quoting Scripture, if you're saying, how authentic must this Scripture be? Well, if he wrote it, he authenticates it, and he's saying, as Moses taught in one section, as God said in another section, as Jesus said, and you're looking at the same verses, you're going, my, oh, my, this really looks like people believe Christ to be God. I am an old fighter. I mean, just... I don't look for fights, but I don't run from very many of them either. And cut my teeth a lot on high school, college campuses. And I'm here to tell you, if you open your mouth at all about the faith, there are at least two questions you're going to have thrown in your face because so much of what we believe is predicated on both of them. One is that Christ was more than a carpenter. Uh, this world is more than willing to accept him as an avatar, an ascended master, you know, a wonderful philanthropist who lived a, a, a wonderful life, and if you just emulate his life, then you too can be a good person like him. Uh, he's, he's the third highest prophet if you're a Muslim. He's ascended master if you're into Zen. In other words, there are so many people that will say good things about Jesus, but as soon as you say, actually, he claimed to be God in the flesh, and he was the way, the truth, and the life, then it's like, oh, you're one of them. Well, you know, the Bible doesn't even say that. I mean, if you'll really read your Bible, because I've always heard and I love that because they don't expect you to be able to come back with anything. And, and then you look like, okay, you're just this biased partisan person, you're in love with Jesus, and that's fine if he works for you, but there's a lot of other things that work for me too, and as long as it works, you know, you can get to Seattle by pogo stick, you can get there by uh, track, by running, by train, as long as you get there, that's all that matters. If you're a loving person, I'm sure God will smile on you, and I'm sure Jesus will too. You get that kind of a notion. The second question you're going to get, and that's why I was glad Geisler had addressed it, and Phil Fernandez is going to be addressing it, is, is the Bible authentic? Is the Bible reliable? Uh, so much of what you say, Carl, comes, you say, Jesus said, because it's in the Bible. But I have heard my whole life, it's from grade school, through junior high, through high school, through undergraduate work, through graduate work, that the Bible is a book of fairy tales. If you want to read it, you know, for some good inspiration, feel good stuff, that's fine. But nobody very smart really believes that it's actually be taken seriously. I mean, you know, there are so many new gospels, there are so many Gnostic gospels. Well, you saw what Dan Brown said, that the real gospels were tossed out at the Council of Nicaea, you know, back in 325 AD, which is nonsense. In other words, they're loaded up with stuff that says, you know what? It's fine you're quoting Jesus, but you're quoting him from a book that isn't accurate, it isn't reliable, it isn't true. And I would suggest that if you are a Christian and you don't get either one of those questions tossed at you, then you are not talking to very many people about Jesus. Because it doesn't take very long before you have both of those questions tossed in your face. And if the only thing I come up with is, well, Carl told me in my church I memorized, in the catechism I learned, you're going to get blown off. When I talk with Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses, I welcome them to my door. They, they take it as a badge of honor when Christians run. They'll say, see, we're part of the narrow way. Didn't Jesus say that? There's a narrow way, there's a broad way. And look, even religious people are afraid to talk with us. And I'm saying, you may think you're doing something wise by not engaging with them. I'm suggesting we better figure out what we believe and why we believe it so we do engage them so they don't see our running as just a victory for them. And a reinforcement, see, we're, we're part of the truth. So again, I'm going to come back and say, if it is fundamental and foundational to Christian faith, that we believe Jesus Christ, the reason he could pay for sin was because he had no sin. And if all men sin and come short of the glory of God and yet Jesus did not sin, I remember I had a philosophy teacher way back when say, I got a question for y'all smart guys in this class. He said, uh, and it wasn't a Christian school. He goes, uh, all men are supposed to have sinned. We all sin, it's his human, right? And yet Jesus was, was without sin. At least that's what they said. That's what the Bible says. People around him, he's still esteemed highly. Who was he? Was he just a carpenter? And I thought, what a heck of a question. Someone thinking of philosophy bar, I'm just going, I, I, don't, I don't totally understand what all is going on with this kind of thing. See, it took a perfect sacrifice to pay for sin. 
If you are less than perfect, then you can't pay for your own sin because you owe. That's why that whole message about it took the one who was the perfect lamb who came to take away the sin of the world. If he doesn't owe for sin, then he can vicariously give his payment on behalf of anybody he wants because he wasn't indebted to anything. If you're indebted to anything, you don't give away what you've got. You've got to pay for what you've done. So the Bible's pretty clear for salvation to be true, Christ had to be perfect, the perfect Lamb of God. If all men sin, then Christ had to be more than a man. That was McDowell's little book, More Than a Carpenter. It was a great little title 30 years ago, and it's still a great title today. Now here's what I'm saying. I'm going to assume that most of you in here are believers. I want to give you ammo. If there are some of you in here, I know we've got people here at the conference that aren't Christians. I hope there's something that could be said that Uh, If you're like me, I did not grow up in a Christian home. I did not grow up hearing Christian things. I grew up in a very academic home, a mom a teacher, a dad a professor. And things about Christianity were usually... It's just irrelevant. Who needs it? Just use your brain. It It wasn't necessarily hostile. It was just, it's irrelevant. It's just silly. You know, you can do anything you put your mind to. Uh, there may be some people that, uh, you know, I laughed, I said I was being taught evolutionary biology from a dad that taught evolutionary biology before I could read. And we had the pictures laid out on my floor and he's walking me through all this stuff as a kid before I'm even in school. So for someone saying, uh, all of us know these things are true because we're all raised in Christian home, hey, that's not true and becoming less and less true. So if you're someone just saying, I'm looking for answers, I, 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 I asked the first path, why, 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 why? Because my dad told me, you can either pretend like you know it and walk out still feeling just as stupid because you didn't, or ask why. And he said, the fact of the matter is there's probably other people in the room asking, they just don't want to look ignorant so they don't ask. So I quit worrying about the pretense and just said, when I don't get it, I'm sticking up a hand and say, why? Why do you believe that? Where's that from? Because see, then you walk out with something you can use in the next conversation. So I'm going to try and give you something that's simple, that's clean, on where did Christ actually claim to be God? Remember, remember C.S. Lewis? You don't because he was dead. None of us are probably old enough. But <laughs> C.S. Lewis popularized something that McDowell used, James Montgomery Boyce used, Lee Strobel used, so many of them. Jesus was liar, lord, or lunatic. I have worked through that little trilogy with so many people. Just I can do that baby in my sleep, right? Was he liar? Is it true that the one who was a deceptive liar, you know, actually brought more truth to the world than anybody? You know, what, how, would, how would his disciples have lived with him not have caught on soon enough? Uh, you know, that something is wrong with this guy. Uh, and which part of his teaching make you, make you think he's a liar, right? Was he a loony? Just a super nice guy, but he was just tweaked. Which part of that is consistent with his lifestyle? Always consistent. Always con- In other words, nah, it doesn't make sense he was a liar. He seemed to be a very good man. It doesn't make sense he was tweaked. He was too rational, too clean. Even when people would ask him trick questions, he'd end up turning it back on them. Not really characteristic of that kind of a consistency with someone that's whacked. Well, maybe it's possible he was who he claimed to be, God. In other words, it's a sweet little way of working people through. But the effectiveness of that trillage is all predicated upon if you say he claimed to be God, someone says, where? That you can actually put it on the table. Well, here's where he said that. Because if you say, well, that's what I heard, they're going to go, all right, you go to the Moose Club, you go to the Church Club, I go to the Buffalo Club, we're all club members. I mean, in other words, if you say you believe it, put it on the table. If you can't put it on the table, why would you say? Someone will say, well, no one can have all the answers to all the questions. True, but something as fundamental as, why do I believe the Bible's authentic? Be ready for that when it's coming. Why do I believe Jesus Christ was more than a carpenter? He claimed to be God. It's coming. I need to be able to do better than just say, I feel in my heart. I've always heard, if you're a skeptic, if you're coming from where I would have been, I would have said, you're weak. And you clearly don't understand what you say you believe. So why should I be interested in what you say you believe? So I want to be able to put that on the table. I work this whole question about where did Christ claim to be God? I work it and I call it three tiers. You can do it any way you want. You can take any of this. If you catch a lot of verses, fine. If you just get one at each tier, you're going to have 100% more than most people are going to be working with. Because most people say it, I believe it, I think it, I've been taught it, it's true in my heart, but they don't put it on the table. Very unsatisfying to the skeptic. So first tier, I ask this, where did Jesus Christ himself claim to be God? Second tier, Where did Jesus Christ make statements that would only make sense if he believed himself to be God? And then third tier, are there verses, are there places where either his friends or his enemies said, yep, that's what he said. That's exactly what he said. Now, I have suggested after years of getting beat around and talking with people, start with the first tier. Start with verses where Christ claimed to be God. Why? 
I believe there's a logical consistency for doing that. I want you to understand my thinking why. A lot of people will write off, go to John 1, 1. Great verse. What's it say? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was what? The Word is clearly Christ. Verse 12, you know, says He came to His own. He gets salvation through Him. Verse 14, He became flesh. Great verses. And, and anyone that you know, knows anything about context will say, well, the Word is Christ. And that clearly says the Word was not only with God, He was. Verses 2 and 3 says that through Him, Christ, everything that was made that has been made, there's nothing that exists apart from Him. So John 1 declares Him to be what? Creator. It's a great verse. He was God and He's Creator. You know what my first comment would have been with that? What was John by occupation? He was a fisherman. Why would I care what a fisherman says about questions like that dealing with life? If you want to show me where Christ said something, I have respect for Christ. Look at his life, even as a non-Christian. Look at his life. He was a wonderful person. If Jesus said it, I will at least listen. Tax gatherers, why? they were cheats. Why would I care what Matthew said? Doctors, you get good ones, you get bad ones. Why would I care? Peter, fisherman again. John, fisherman again. In other words, start with the words of Christ. Why? Other than Satanism, I am not aware of any religious ism that has a disrespectful view of Jesus. He may be a God of Jehovah Witnesses. He may be the third highest prophet of Mormons. Uh, he may be an ascended master, you know, in Zen. Even in atheistic religions, they revere him. A wonderful human being. Start with verses where he said something because it's harder to blow him off when you already affirm him as he was a good person. If I say he was a good person, then I say, was he deliberately lying about what he was saying? That's a tough question because if they say, yes, he is, I'm going to say what? Then why are you calling him good? And if they say, no, he wouldn't lie, then I'll say, then why don't you believe what he said? So it puts people in an awkward situation to listen. So start with the first tier. A lot of places you can go with that. I like to, I'll give you several of them where I like to go. I don't know the particular, in the book I've got on this stuff, I don't remember the order, it probably doesn't matter as long as we cover them. Uh, turn to John 8. We're going to have to do this fast. John 8 starts in verse 51 through 59. I'm going to just tell you the story, you can read it, be a Berean, check to see if it's so. Basically Jesus says in verse 51 that if you believe my words you'll never die. Now, he's got a Jewish audience, they're surprised going, <laughs> Abraham never said that. None of the prophets said that. Are you greater than them? How, how in the world are you saying, if we hear, hear your words, you will never die? Who, who are you? Well, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it. Now hold it, Abraham died 1,800 years ago. You're not even yet 50 years old. How, how in the world did Abraham and you ever connect? That's not even possible. Who are you? That's what they're asking him. Who are you? His response, verse 858, I tell you before, Abraham ever came, ever, ever was, I am. Ego me. You want to sound fancy? Present, active, indicative, first person form of the verb to be. Anyone, anyone that reads Koine Greek will say, yep, that's, that's what he was saying. It always means I am, does not mean I have been, which is what the Jehovah Witnesses say, because they run from this verse. You know, people, you know, if I use the word bastardize, I don't mean it's swearing. I mean they change it. They manipulate it. It means I am. It says verse 59, they picked up stones to throw at him. Why were they so upset? Because you go to Exodus chapter 3 and read verses 13 to 15. Remember Moses' dialogue? You've called me to be deliverer. I'm supposed to be the deliverer of Israel and I don't even know your name. I'm going to go to the children of Israel and say, God has sent me. And they're going to say, okay, hot shot. What's his name? I don't know your name. Then they're not going to take me serious. What's he saying then? I am who I am, verse 15, thus you shall tell the children of Israel, this is my memorial name for all generations I am has sent you. In other words, for all time my name is what? The great I am. So when the Jews asked Jesus in John 8, who are you claiming to be? How could you be older than Abraham? He died 1,800 years ago. How can you say when I accept your words you'll never die? The prophets never said that. And his response was what? I am. It says they immediately picked up stones for blasphemy. Why? Because he was a man claiming he was what? That's why they were going to kill him. Did Jesus claim to be God? Yes, he did. John 10. Just turn a couple of pages further. Start at 27. My sheep hear my voice. They know me. I, I give them what? Interesting statement if all of you is a, par, a, a, a prophet. Interesting statement if all of you is a, is a, is a carpenter. Right? We'll, we'll get back to that. He says, no one can take my sheep out of my hands. No one can take the sheep out of my father's hands because I and the father are what? They immediately reach down to do what? 
He says, many good works I've shown you from the Father. For which of these are you attempting to stone me? What's their answer in 32? It's not for a good work we seek to stone you, but you, a mere man, just claim to be what? Did Jesus claim to be God? Did they understand the statement? Yes. Now, if you're, I'll just give you a little freebie on this. If you're ever talking with J-dubs, they will tell you this. They will say, Jesus, it's interesting, in the back of their book, it's always the verses that have to do with the deity of Christ that they've significantly changed. If I was a J-dub, I would say, is that more than coincidental? You know, they have quite a section on John 1-1, 1, 1, quite a section on John 8, quite a section on John 10. I love it when they come to the door because they'll say, well, if you read Greek, you know, you'd understand there are special rules and this is what this means, so I'll give my Greek New Testament and I'll say, well, help me understand that. And they'll go, what's that? And I'll say, that's what I thought. You're trying to tell me what a Greek text says. You don't know an alpha from a beta if it bit you. I, if you don't know it, then let's not talk about it. Let's just say what, see what the text says, okay? And then they'll look and they'll go, oh, I better quit using that line about, well, the original text says. They don't know if that's what it says anyway, right? But I'll tell you a little bit about, about what that says. In John chapter 30, I and my father one, they'll say, all Jesus is saying is the Father's forgiving, so he's forgiving. The Father shows love, so he shows love. Jesus just embodies what you would see in God if you ever saw God. He has the attributes of God as far as character, but that doesn't make him God. That's all he's saying. I go, oh, okay, I get it. Well, first question then I would ask, why in the world did Orthodox Jewish rabbis who he was talking to, who had a desire to walk with God, if all Jesus was saying is, I want to emulate God's life, I want to be loving, forgiving, caring, just like the Father, why would you pick up stones and say, we're going to kill you for such a horrible thing? In other words, the context makes no sense if that's all he's saying. They got it. And then uh, the word one, you know, in gender, you can use masculine, feminine, or neuter, neuter endings in Koine Greek, right? The, the, the endings are supposed to agree with the subject. I and my father compound subject of what? Masculine, feminine, or neuter? I and my father. Masculine, thank you. So the word one should have ended with a masculine ending when he said, I and my father are one. The Greeks would use a neuter ending when they wanted to talk about essence rather than sexual gender. So when he said, I and my father are one, what those religious leaders heard him say is, in essence, I and my father are exactly the same. He just said, no one can take the sheep out of my hands, no one can take the sheep out of my father's hands, because I and my father, in essence, are exactly the same. We're one. If you're claiming to be, in essence, equal with God, who are you claiming to be? That's why they picked up the rocks. When he said, what's the good work you want to storm? They said, not for good works, but you're a mere man that just told us you are. Bingo, they got the message. He didn't deny it. Didn't deny it in John 8, didn't deny it in John 10. How about Mark chapter 14, verses 61 to 64? The high priest is really, really frustrated with Jesus because he won't talk to him. So he says, I abjure you. Finally, you've, you've got parallels of this too. I just, Mark, I just... You, you can, here's how you remember before the high priest. You ready for this? Here's the name. If you remember how many books are in each Bible, in each gospel, the last one is resurrection, right? The, the one just before is crucifixion, and the one just before is trial. So if there's 16 chapters in Mark, it's 14, 15, 16. Trial, crucifixion, resurrection. In Matthew, there's 28, right? So you've got 26, 27, 28. Trial, crucifixion, resurrection. And in other words, you, you see what I'm saying? Just if someone says, man, you're a scholar. You go, no, I just know the last three chapters are dealing with either the trial, the resurrection, you know, the, the crucifixion, or the resurrection. They'll go, that's amazing. No, it's just remembering simple things like that. Now, he says, the high priest says to him, are you the Christ? That meant Messiah. Christ was just the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. So if you were a Hebrew, you'd say, are you Messiah? If you were Greek, you'd say, are you the Christ? Meant the same thing. Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? What's his answer? I am. That's all he said. And it says with that, the high priest tears his clothes, and he says, why in the world do we need more testimony, meaning from the people that they were trying to trump up stuff? You heard it from him. And then he says something else, interesting. You're going to see the Son of Man returning in the clouds. That really ticked him off. Why? Because in Daniel chapter 7, 13 to 15, Daniel says that when the Son of Man comes back, he will come in the clouds, the whole world is going to bow to him in worship, and his reign is eternal. Now, if your reign is eternal, then you better be what? 
And if the whole world is going to bow to you since you worship God and Him only, who are you claiming to be? So Daniel was talking about son of man, not saying, oh, he's identifying with people. It was a messianic title for God who is going to return in the flesh. So when Jesus says to his answer, are you the Christ? I am. And you're going to see the son of man returning in the clouds. They're going, this cat thinks he is God. What should we do? Crucify him. That's why they killed him. For what? For blasphemy. Did Jesus claim to be God? Yes, he did. He did it in John 8. He did it in John 10. He did it in Mark chapter 14. There's more, but let's just get this because i got to cut some of this. Now, first tier. Did Jesus claim to be God? Yes. I'm telling you that the majority of people that you talk to, even in your church, even if they affirm that's true, if you say where, they'll go, it's in there somewhere. That is not helpful when you're wanting to contend for the faith, Jude 3, that was once for all time delivered to the saints. That's not helpful when 1 Peter, remember it's an imperative. 1 Peter 3, what's an imperative? It's a command. It's not a wish. It's not a request. It's a command. Sanctify Christ in your heart. Be ready to give a reasonable answer for reasonable questions you receive concerning your faith. Just do it with an attitude that's gentle. The word gentle, word picture is a horse. Have power, but it's under control. You don't roll over. You don't have to play weak. You don't have to go, oh gosh, you're probably not going to like my answer. I don't care whether they like my answer or not. In other words, just make sure it's accurate and do it with an attitude that's just not purposely offensive. Well, you know, you've just got us so much humility. Oh, yeah, where did Jesus? Well, you probably wouldn't like my answer, and I'm sure there's so many things I don't know, but there's a few things I might know, and if you'd just stick with me for a while. I've got notes back at the house. You give me a couple hours to get back home. I'm going to go, I have no interest in talking with you. Either you know what you're talking about or you what? You don't. Apparently you don't. I'm off to my next situation. And then that person's saying, oh, God, why don't you use me? I wish you'd use me. I just tried, Carl. <laughs> I just tried. All right, so what am I suggesting? I'm suggesting you don't have to have verses memorized word perfect. I always have some of the teachers, especially with the kids, go, don't say that. I'm going, non-Christians do not know what the verses say. They may know John 3.16. You know, maybe they heard that at a football game or something. But for most verses, they don't have a clue. Why didn't you share that verse? Well, I couldn't remember Romans 5.1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that through Jesus Christ it's possible to have peace with God? Do you, what if I get it wrong? They won't know. You just be close enough that if they open a Bible to Romans 5.1, they'll go, yeah, that's, that's what it said. For God so loved the world. Ah, no, no, God so loved the world. Why'd you put the conjunction in there? Oh, man, I screwed it up. God will never use me again. You know, <laughs> Non-Christians, I'm giving them more credit than they deserve. They don't know. So as a Christian, don't back off sharing something as long as you're close enough to the verse and what it's saying, share it. And then just say, let's both go read that, right? If they don't think you're going to put anything on the table and you put something on the table, who looks foolish if you say, would you like, you told me I couldn't show you that. You told me it's not in the Bible. Your teachers have told you. I, I just could, could we look there? How many of them feel comfortable going, no, nah, I was just kidding. I don't really even care. Most of them just feel obligated now because they're the one that started the caustic question. They just didn't figure anyone would talk back. Did Jesus claim to be God? Yes. Did he make inferences? Look at Mark chapter 2, about 5 through 8. You know, remember the paralytic story? You've got it also in Luke uh, chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 9. Three different, three different gospels include this. What's the bottom line, what they're after? Jesus preaching, Jesus been healing, they tear the roof off, they let the guy down through. Jesus looks at the man and says, son, your sins are forgiven. Then it says Jesus immediately knew what was going on in their heart, which ought to be a clue he's more than a carpenter, because how does, how, do how does he know immediately what's going on in their heart? Which is easier to say, this man's sins are forgiven, or get up and walk out of here? But to show you that the Son of Man, which is what kind of title? It's a messianic title for God who's become flesh, right? That the, it's not, oh my, I remember Flossy did, well, when he wanted you to think he was God, he'd say son of God, and when he wanted you to think he was man, he'd say son of man, so just read it that way. That's wrong. Son of man was a messianic title. It was not just saying I'm just human. It was used of the one who is God who's going to become flesh and die, like Isaiah 53. You know, he's, he's going to come and die first, then he's going to come back to reign. So when they give you that distinction... They took a class 30 years ago from someone that didn't know what they were talking about either. You know, it's kind of what was going on. So that you know the Son of Man has authority to forgive sin, get up and walk out of here. Their response was, but only who can forgive sin? Only God forgives sin. And he's saying, let's connect the dots. You're right. Only God ultimately forgives sin. 
I just forgave his sin. Who, if only God, who, who are you? You're going, come on, pal, put it together. <laughs> put it together. How about back to John 10, verse 27, 28. My sheep hear my voice, they follow me. I give them what? Who gives eternal life? What did Christ claim he could give? Then who did he think he was? In other words, if it's a prerogative that's reserved for God, God forgives sin, but he says he forgives sin. God gives eternal life. He says he can give eternal life. This cat really believes he's who? He really does. You know, you start, sorry, John chapter 5. If you do not honor me with the same honor that you honor the Father, you dishonor the Father. Now, if you're claiming that you are worthy of the same honor that is given to God the Father, and if you don't honor me with the same honor you honor him, you dishonor him, who are you claiming to be? How about John chapter 20? Remember Thomas? He gets a bad rap being the doubter. <laughs> there were a lot of them afraid. 28, 29, he's alive. And I'm not buying that. I wasn't there in the meeting unless I can stick my finger here and my hand there. I always thought that too. How, how big was that hole in his side to stick his hand there? Yeah, it had to be a heck of a hole when they lanced him, right? Because he says, unless I can put my fingers in the prints and my hand in his side, I go, whew, they, they opened that boy up. But here's what I'm after. I'm not buying this stuff. It says, eight days later, Jesus appears. This time, Thomas is there. He says, hey, Thomas, come here. Put, put your hands right here. Put your fingers. Put your hand. Now, if I asked Thomas, I think I'd have dropped right there. Because I'm going, how did he know that's what I'd said? I mean, how, how did he know? Now, his response, you are Lord and you are God. You are my Lord. You are my God. 28. 29, Jesus... Remember, angel falls in front of John. He says, get off your feet. I'm a fellow servant like you. You know, People drop in front of Paul. <laughs> Don't be doing that. Get up off your feet. Believer drops in front of him. At first Peter, and Peter writes about it. Get off your feet. We're fellow servants. Thomas, it says, bows down, identifies him as Lord and God, and worships him. What's Jesus' response in 29? Because you have seen, you get it. More blessed those who not seen but will still believe. Did he accept worship? But if only God is to be worshipped, who is he telling people he is? That's exactly right. Did he make statements where he claimed to be God? The answer is what? Yes. Yes. Did he make statements that only make sense if that's who he thought he was? The answer is what? Yes. Now, I go to that third tier to work with what did friends and enemies say? We already talked about the enemies. Why did they crucify him? Say, because he claimed to be God. Did they hear his message? Yes, they killed him for it. Now, how about John 1? John the Apostle, he was willing to die for him. Boiled in oil, just surprised him and didn't die. So they isolate him you know, out on Patmos and he just keeps writing, surprising him. God keeps using him. John identifies him in John 1. 1 as who? It says you're God. How about Titus chapter 2, verse 13? Paul says of Jesus Christ, he is our great God and our great Savior. We're eagerly awaiting his coming. He's who? Our great God and great Savior. Was Paul a Jewish scholar? Say yes. Did he understand what he was saying when he said that? Of course he understood what he was saying. Now, if you want, you can even tie that back in. Try this one. Isaiah 44, 6. Tie Isaiah 44, 6. And, and tie uh, Isaiah 43, 11. Isaiah says there's only one God. 43 says there's only one Savior. Would Paul have known the book of Isaiah? If there's only one God and one Savior, and in Titus chapter 2, 13, he's now saying we really await Jesus, who is our great God and Savior. He understood what he was saying. How about 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1? Here's Peter, another Orthodox Jew. He says, Jesus Christ, our great God and Savior. Read the text. I'm not making it up. Peter says he's God and Savior. He understood there's only one true God and there's only one true Savior. And they said, that's Jesus. Paul said the same thing. How about uh, Philippians chapter 2? Everybody memorizes verse uh, 4, you know, about the attitude we're supposed to have. It's a great verse to memorize, but I like 5 and 6. I'm to have that attitude in me, you know, like, like Christ, who, verse 5, who although he existed in the very nature of God, 5, 6, did not regard his equality with God as something that he had to maintain, but willingly emptied himself, taking on the form of a man to die on a cross. 
Oh, that says he went to the cross. Yes, it did. But who does he say he is that went to the cross? He was 1 verse 5 says, in very nature he was who? God, and did not regard his, does it say inferiority with God? You know, he's a demigod. You know, he's a little god like the J-dubs. You know, he's, he's God, kind of God, just kind of a little god. Or, you know, the Ravi will tell you millions of gods in Hinduism. He's one of them. That, that, that isn't, he didn't say he was, there's a big god, and then there's me, the little god. In very nature existed as God did not regard six. His equality with God is something that he had to maintain or hold on to, but willingly emptied himself to take on the form of a man to die. Did Paul say he was God? Yes, he did. Did John say he was God? Yes, he did. Did Thomas, when he bows down and worship him, identify him as God? Folks, there are so many great verses that go, his friends certainly thought he was God. That's what they heard, and they were willing to die for it. They must have been fairly certain they knew what they were hearing. I'm not exactly sure what he said. Are you wanting to die for that? Not exactly. If I'm 100% certain I saw this cat alive, I saw this guy resurrected after the dead, he told us all along he was God, and by golly he did it. Remember? Remember? Tear down this temple, three days later I'll raise it back up. It took 46 years to build this thing. How in the world are you going to... It says he wasn't talking about the stone temple, temple of his heart. I love that. No one takes my life. He said, I lay it down, I'll take it back up again. When you claim you have the authority to not only take life, but to give yourself life back again, who are you claiming to be? Did the disciples get the message? Yes, they did. Were they willing to die for what they heard? Yes, they were. Did his enemies get the message? Yes, they did. What did they do because of that message? They killed him. Did Jesus make inferences that only make sense? There's more, you know, you can find more, but I gave you four or five of them, what? He accepted what? Worship. Say worship, a prerogative of God. He said he could give what? Eternal life, prerogative of God. In other words, think through that stuff and you're going, well, there are other things he said that sure sound like that's what he was saying. And then you can go to the John 8, the John 10. How about, let's, one more, and I'm going to let you out. I said the t- you can take till 10 after, but it'll give you a chance to get to the next room. So please go. I asked the people to shut down the book, book tables for these two times so we don't get lost. So please don't go to the book. I want you to buy everything you want to take home. Just don't do it between the two workshops. Do it after you get back from lunch, right? Because it's, it's just going to sh- make it tougher. Now I forgot what it was I was going to say. <laughs> say it again. I can't hear you. John 8. Holy smoke. What was I going to tell you about John 8? Yeah, he sure did. Uh, <laughs> Can you, can you tell I'm 61 instead of 31? Um, okay, okay, accepted, you know, we already said that. Friends saw it, enemies saw it. I've given you verses on that. Made inferences. Oh, yeah. He's willing to die for, yeah. Well, I'll just say it again. If you're willing to die for what you say you heard, there wasn't a lot of mumbling. Because at some point you're going to go, I'm out of here. McDowell, he probably still says, but he used to say that, uh, at least when I, he said, cowards and martyrs are not made of the same material. Nope. Yeah? Cowards are the one that will sing the stories until there's pressure put on you. And at that point you go, I'm, I'm out of here. Martyrs are the ones that say, that's what I heard, that's what he said, and if you're going to take my life, take my life. You don't have to go back first century. How about 21 Egyptian Coptic? All you have to do is renounce Christ. What were they? Beheaded. How about the kids at that college? 167, whatever it was. I loved it with the media. You know, well, there were some religious differences. They never said Muslims were killing Christians. Really hard to find that, right? Said they selectively went through, if you're Muslim, you live. If you're Christian, they killed you. I go, where does the media say something like that? They see, we, they get a free pass. Yeah, yeah, that's a whole different story. But again, where am I going? I, I guess I'm just saying this. I, I forgot where I was going to go. I had something I wanted to share. I don't remember now, but... That's a great verse, 8.24, John 5.24 is a great verse, John 11, 25, and 26, good verses, lots of good ones. All I'm saying is this, if you tell people you stand for Christ, then know enough about what you believe that if you're given the opportunity to say something, you can put it on the table. Now, the lower their expectations are of you, the easier it is to look good. <laughs> if they don't figure you know anything, then if you know something, that, and I, again, I'm not trying to be cynical, but I'm telling you, I got... St- I, I, when I came to Christ, uh, it, it was not praise God and hallelujah, the lost kid is finally back. Is you did what? 
You did what? I remember my dad's response, don't talk to me about this stuff. I don't need a kid telling me anything about this kind of stuff. I brought up the Holy Spirit. He goes, what's the Holy Spirit? You can't even see anything anyway. You know, don't, don't talk about it. In other words, when you've got people that you know are going to be challenging you, even right in your own home, it's real good if I'm going to make statements to go, I would like to be able to support them. Well, people are not one to Christ through, a, through apologetics like this. If you just spent the time here teaching people how to share their faith, then how much better would it would they? Well, see, I'm assuming people that are interested enough to get answers for questions are already interested in being able to share their faith with somebody. But see, I think this goes a step further. It's saying, you're right, apologetics don't, lead, don't, 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 don't save people, but they certainly help remove excuses from people that are saying, I'm not going to believe unless. I'm not going to believe unless. I never get a straight answer out of your religious people about, well, maybe I'll fulfill that same expectation and not give you a straight answer, but let me give it a try. Really? We can talk? Sure, let's go. It's free. You don't like what you said? Doors open, you can walk out and leave. I wasn't expecting an answer. I know. So I don't have to have much of an answer because you're used to people running, right? So I'm suggesting, how do you give what you don't have? How do you share what you do not know? I want God to use me to impact things. Then learn the book. Learn the book. Otherwise, I feel in my heart. I feel in my heart. I remember I had a stake missionary say, I feel in my heart. And I said, is that because God was talking to you? Or is that what you ate last night? He looked at me, I'm telling you serious. And this is not Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness. He said, but I, I feel in my heart. God, God gave me a burning in my bosom. Told me, if you're from a Mormon background, I've got Mormon family people. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to make fun. I love, but, but I feel in my heart. I said, okay. I said, I feel like raping your wife. He looked at me and he said, you can't do that. I said, sure, I'm perfectly capable of doing that. He said, well, that would be wrong. I said, but I felt it in my heart. So I say, once you remove the Bible out of the equation, then we're free to think and do whatever we want as long as we can justify it by saying, well, in my mind I think or in my heart I feel. That's why when people lead with this, well, I think in my heart, I'm going, sentimentally, I'm, I'm with you, I understand, but I'm not giving my life for something you said you felt in your heart. I'm going to go back to the Bereans and say, check the scripture, make sure it's so, and be able to stand on it. 